From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. A flock of robins visited my garden recently for a three-day long field day. By the time they decamped, I was down about 40 mature winterberry holly shrubs worth of fruit. But we had fun together while the frenzy lasted. I love feeding birds with help from the garden plants or with supplemental bird seed too. And I love keeping records of who visits when. The annual winter-long citizen science event called Project Feeder Watch from Cornell Lab of Ornithology is just getting underway as it does each November. So what better time to talk about just that, the best practices and also what all the data is telling scientists and can tell you too. So more in a moment, but first these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Today's guest, Dr. Emma Gregg, leads Project Feeder Watch at Cornell, a citizen science effort with more than 30 years of history and more than 20,000 participants in North America who don't just feed birds, but also share their observation. Welcome back to the program, Emma, and happy feeder watch season. I bet you're glad it's back again. I am glad. Thank you so much for having me and for uh, spreading the word about feeder watch. Yeah, I really need my bird companions this year. And I'm, as I've told you before when we've spoken, I'm in an area where we have black bears, so I can't feed except once they take a nap. (laughs) So I can't Mm, wait. That's that's right. (laughs) Um, so just before we get started, I renewed my feeder watch membership the other day. And, um, I wanted to say that with the transcript of the show over on away to garden.com, we'll draw, we'll have a giveaway. We'll draw the names of a couple of random commenters and I'm going to, um, buy a couple of extra memberships for people. So people should go over and participate and join in and, or buy a membership themselves. And, um, and also to say that you and a colleague are giving a free webinar about feeding birds uh, noon on uh, Eastern time on November 19th, I think. Is that right? That is right. Yeah. So if you haven't heard enough by the end of this show, you can tune in again. And Holly and I will be chatting about feeder watch and feeding birds. So hopefully it'll be a lot of fun. And I think you take Q&A. Do you as well? Mm-hmm. We do. So that'll be good. So if people have questions after this, they can certainly join for that. So, so yeah, um, birds, you know, watching them, feeding them, all on the rise this year. Um, so I suspect you had an uptick uh, in in participation, did you, this year with Feeder Watch? With, when I say this year, I mean last fall through late this winter. Yeah, uh, there were more people than ever watching their feeders and – Normally, Feeder Watch is a program that runs from November through early April. But if you remember, this past spring, we were all stuck at home a lot more than usual. So we went ahead and extended the Feeder Watch season until the end of April. And so many people wrote to us saying, thank you for extending the season. And they submitted so many more checklists. So I think that with all of us spending a lot more time at home, people are really starting to appreciate even more the birds that are around their homes. Now, none of the birds sent thank you notes to you? <laughs> <laughs> Just the feeder watchers. <laughs> um, and the numbers, I mean, of the number of, of Americans who are bird watchers, I think, it, I, I don't know, I think the last ones I read were like 2016 numbers that were like 45 million bird watchers and I don't know, $1.8 billion spent on equipment, and I can't remember how much on bird seed, but it was more than that even, I think, wasn't it? It's like $4 yeah. billion or something. Yeah. Exactly. It's billions of dollars spent on bird seed and, and gardening supplies for birds. So it's really a, a very popular pastime, but a really wonderful one, too, because what's better than connecting with the nature that's right out your window? Right. And so you're extending again this year? Uh, well, this we, season? <laughs> we may. We haven't fully decided yet, but I okay. see no reason why we why couldn't keep it open through the end of April. But but I don't know for sure yet. Don't know for sure. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, so I love looking at sort of, you know, that 
me too? Do I, how do I compare to what other people are seeing? That sense of community that it can provide when I look at the data. Um, you have this wonderful website, and I'm going to give lots of links to that. We'll talk about some of the aspects. I love looking at, I always look first, and you just sent out the winter news, uh, sort of the the, the um, postseason newsletter, and it's had the top 25 bird, you know, highlights. And I thought maybe we could start there, like some of the top 25 birds. Like, for instance, I'm in the Northeast, Cornell's in the Northeast. Maybe we start there, some highlights, and then Southeast and whatever, a couple of things that were interesting to you that were in the the data. Yeah. Um, yeah, every year we summarize all, all of the data from the past year and uh, write, uh, I guess you would call it a newsletter called Winter Bird Highlights. Right. And we do what's called a regional roundup. And so in that, we sort of pick out some cool trends that show up in the data. Um, and so in the Northeast region this past year, one of the things that I noticed as I was looking through the data was um, that northern flickers are becoming a little bit more abundant in the Northeast than in the Southeast. So mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a shift in the range of these flickers. So that's one thing that, you know, just popped up from looking at the trend graph that we have on the website and that I then look at to write this report. So, you know, who knows exactly why that's happening. It could be changes in habitat, changes in the climate. But this is just one species, and there are lots to look at online, and really you can make your own discoveries. Yeah, the eastern bluebirds, and, and so flickers made the top 25 in the northeast for the first time, I think, in the 30-something years, but eastern bluebirds didn't make the top 25, but I think you're noting an uptick in them in some areas, too, is that right? In the southeast, eastern bluebirds are continuing to increase. They're becoming oh. more and more abundant in backyards. And they're a warm adapted species, so it makes sense that as our winters become more mild in the eastern part of the continent, these warm adapted species become more common. So it's true for eastern bluebirds, it's true for species like chipping sparrows, and you might notice also Carolina wrens coming to your backyard more than they used to. Those are <laughs> species that are really on the rise um, in the eastern part of the continent. I'm laughing. I can't. If, if anyone says Carolina Wren, I start to laugh because I have only had the experience, as I've said to you before when we've talked, the last couple of years that they've sort of adopted me as I like to think of it being very, you know, self-centered and <laughs> it's all about me. <laughs> um, but but um, it, it, so a, a, a lineage has now decided to live here right beside the house and has tried to nest in everything from watering cans to a shelf in the garage to, you know, whatever. And, and it, they're so vocal and have so many different vocalizations and it's fascinating. And there's a whole thing that goes on. And it's they're, they're chatty year round, really. They're not quiet in the winter. Like many birds are much quieter in the winter. Yeah, Carolina wrens are just noisy little creatures. It's true. So you're you're making some good observations there. <laughs> um, yeah. So on the southeast, I saw that the northern cardinal has been the top bird every year. I was surprised by that too. I went back and looked at all of the historical top twenty fives from Theater Watch. Can you believe that bird is so uh, steadily number one? They are just quite abundant, and people notice them, too. How could you yeah. not notice a northern cardinal? They're such striking birds. Yeah. Um, um, I was as, surprised. As I think some areas, people call them red birds, yeah? Yep. <laughs> They're nicknames. Certainly are. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so, so there's... Um, these... You were, you were mentioned a minute ago about maps, and the maps seem to be getting, maybe I'm just digging deeper every year myself as a consumer, maybe it was all always there, but they seem more robust and more exciting and sort of interactive and sophisticated the way you're showcasing the data. Um, uh, so for instance, you said about the Carolina Wrens and from 1990 to this year, I can kind of look at the map and slide this little um, 
dial and button across the bottom from year to year to year and just watch the map evolve and see how many feeder watchers saw them in each region in every year along the way and the growth and so forth. It's really fascinating and it kind of validates for feeder watchers. It's like, think about what you've seen and how you think it's changed at your own house and then go look and play with these maps because it's very validating. At least that was my experience. Yes, exactly. The things that are happening in your own backyard may be a reflection of what is happening on a continental level. Right. Now, also, the things that are happening in your own backyard may have to do with what your neighbor is doing. So there are local influences and very broad regional influences that are happening at the same time. But it's really cool to think about what those factors are and think about how your birds match them. Right. So feeder bird, feeder watch, they're called, we call them feeder birds. And so what is a feeder bird really? I mean, is it about these are birds that can hang on a feeder or these are birds that eat certain things like seed that we put out? You know, what, what's a feeder bird? And, and I've been watching birds at feeders for a long time. And I realized that in the process, I've probably been learning a lot about their physiology and their behaviors, although maybe not consciously, like some hang upside down and some can go on a perch and some can only hang on the sort of mesh things and can't grasp a perch. And can we talk a little bit about that, about the different types of birds who are feeder birds? Yeah. Well, I think feeder bird is sort of, in a way, almost kind of whatever happens to come to your feeders is a feeder bird. <laughs> so you can sort of use it how you like. Uh-huh. But it, it's interesting what you're saying about learning about physiology and behavior. And it's true. We are. So, for example, a downy woodpecker, well, you might consider that a feeder bird because downy woodpeckers will come to suet feeders or tube feeders with sunflower seed. They might even come to a tray feeder and grab a few seeds. But So that's a woodpecker. Well, a yellow-bellied sapsucker, that's a bird that's probably never going to come to a bird feeder. Maybe it will come and nibble a little bit of suet, but they just... Sapsuckers, even though they're related to downy woodpeckers and hairy woodpeckers, they don't come to feeders. So here you've got one thing that's a feeder bird and one thing that's not, even though they're kind of relatives to one another. Mm -hmm. So just to say that you're learning about what kind of food preferences birds have and how they like to take their food. Um, Another cool thing that you can observe is the difference between species that like to just sit and eat for a long time. For example, a morning dove might just come and sit at your tray feeder and peck seeds hours on end, whereas a little nuthatch will come and take one seed and fly away because it's going to go eat it somewhere else, or maybe it's going to save it for later and cache it, not even eat it. So these are some really um, significant differences in the foraging behavior of different species that you can notice by how they interact with the food that you provide. Right, and if that sunflower is still in the shell um, versus um, hulled, you know, like chips or hearts, whatever they call them, um, that you might buy that I like to feed, the... (laughs) <laughs> the 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 eating behavior also changes a little bit because it can be work to get it out of the shell. Do, do you know what I mean? It's like sometimes you see certain birds sort of almost looking like they're gobbling down seed after seed after seed with the ones outside the shell already that have been hulled, but not with the ones in the shell. They have to go take them and crack them open somewhere, and they don't want to be out in that exposed place, or at least that's my inference. It may be incorrect. They don't want to be out in that, that exposed place while they're cracking open each individual seed you know they go somewhere else <laughs> yeah exactly and and sometimes you can see where a little chickadee will go with its sunflower seed and then you can watch them just hammering away at the thing trying to get it open so right. there's all kinds of cool behaviors you can watch just from yeah just from your home 
Yeah. Um, and how um, uh, with the caching that you spoke about, I mean, it cracks me up. I mean, the tit mice and so forth, you know, they'll find a place where there's like a piece of window trim or something, you know, or a piece of siding where there's the tiniest little crack and they'll just go back and forth and back and forth and stick the seeds. Right yeah, they love to do that. I And I really enjoy watching blue jays because Sometimes you'll see them take a big peanut or something and fly somewhere, and they'll often bury their caches in the ground. Blue jays, but you could watch this in um, scrub jays as well or stellar jays if you're in the West. They'll bury their food item, and then you'll see them sometimes take little bits of vegetation and cover up the little seed that they've hidden. So they're very meticulous about it, or they can be, and I just think it's so neat to watch. Yeah. So maybe we need to not just look out the window. Maybe we need to go and follow a few of these. <laughs> these guys yeah. are out the yard and see what the heck's going on. Or at least follow with your binoculars. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so foodstuffs, you just said peanuts and um, uh, diff- there's, there's foodstuffs and feeders and different different foods attract different, um, appeal to different birds and different feeder types sort of work best for certain types of birds and so forth. And I love this part of the feeder watch site that's called, I think, common feeder birds. And it's, I think a hundred kinds of birds. And you can kind of cross reference, not just for your region and the time of year, but the type of feeder that suits them and the type of food that suits them. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Cause I think that's just so helpful to people who are interested in feeding effectively. Yeah, that is a tool that we created, oh, I don't know, I would say seven or eight years ago, and we just love it so much because what it really is meant to do is give people an idea of, given whatever their circumstances are, place, the types of feeders they have, what species are they likely to see? And so it helps narrow down what can feel overwhelming if you want to identify birds and you get a field guide, oh, there's hundreds of birds in there. But there aren't actually hundreds of different species that you're likely to see in your backyard. So I I love the the tool for that reason. It just makes it a little more understandable. And you can use it in the opposite direction, too. So let's say you really want to attract red-breasted nuthatches to your bird feeder. Well, if you click on a red-breasted nuthatch picture in this tool, it will tell you where you have to live in order to see one and what kinds of seeds, foods, and feeders to provide that they really like. So you can use it both ways. Right. And it cracks me up if you if you click on Blue Jay and then you look for the food types, there's a long list. <laughs> yeah. ever seen well, you get Blue to Jay learn eat. which species are generalists and are not picky. <laughs> Generalist is a polite word for blue jays. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then and then if you go to certain other birds, even just like a goldfinch, another familiar bird where I am, the the number of seed or of food types that it will uh, prefer or utilize is so much smaller. So thinking about that and thinking about who you can attract and like you said, matching it, working in reverse. Um, and if you filter, if you start with the seeds and you filter for certain types of seeds, like, um, what is it? Sor- sorghum seeds, or what is it called? M-I-L-O, Milo, Milo? How do you say Milo, yeah, Milo. Milo. Yeah, I mean, it's like a few number of birds utilize that versus a few more use millet, but the most use sunflower, I think. And that's really interesting to see. Um, I don't know where... Um, uh, other ones fit in, but it's interesting to see that too, to see where you're going to get the bang for your buck, so to speak. Yeah, that's a really um, good use of it, trying to figure out what seeds will please the most customers so that you can attract the most diversity to your yard with um, the least amount of work. Right. And then the different types of feeders. I mean, you can also sort by that, which is is fun too. I don't have any, um, I love, and I should say you have these wonderful feeder cams going. You have one at Cornell, of course. And people, sometimes this year, I'll confess when it's been really stressful, I'll just link, uh, uh, plug in, I'll just turn on the, the feeder cam, just watch it on my browser and just sit and watch the birds coming to the feeders there or in one of your other feeder cams. And 
Um, but you have these big tray feeders, these big platform feeders, and I don't have any of those. Those look really good. Like, that's a good idea. Yeah, those are great ways to do it. The way my, uh, my father always does tray feeders is when he has stumps from trees that have been chopped down for this or that reason, he'll just sprinkle seed on the top of the stump. So then that's it. And then you have all kinds of stuff coming to have a little nibble on that. So you can be creative with how you do your your platform or tray feeder. Right, right. Um, and we should probably say that we should pr- make an effort to provide water, yes, because that's a really important thing, especially in the cold winter zones. Absolutely. Uh, you Providing water can be a great way to attract birds, even if you don't want to put out a feeder or or maybe you can't because, as you say, you've got bears in the area. Well, you can't mm-hmm. have a feeder out, but you could still, put, well, I should ask you, can you still put out a tray of water? <laughs> Hopefully that's okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. They don't maybe seem not. to be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> in the summer, they sit in my in-ground water gardens like it's a spa, but. <laughs> okay. But in, <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Um, but in the winter, no, I haven't. I mean, well, obviously, in the winter, they're normally resting. But um, uh, so other trends and so forth, you know, other types of birds. I, I think you've written papers, uh, at least one paper that I read about a particular Western species of hummingbird and some of the changes you've observed, like the Anna's hummingbird, I believe. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's not what yeah. I think of as a winter feeder bird. Obviously, hummingbirds we don't have in the Northeast in the winter, but... Right. I think that is part of why I was so enchanted by this little hummingbird in the West that is not really migratory. And as hummingbirds just stay where they want to be all year. And they have been spending their winters and moving more and more further north. So now, even if you're in British Columbia or even Alaska, you might have an Anna's hummingbird at your bird feeder when there is snow on the ground and ice on the branches. It's just amazing to me that these birds can persist in those cold temperatures. And so what it tells us is that they're not necessarily limited by temperature. They're limited by food availability. Well, the amazing thing that became evident from looking at feeder watch data thanks to everyone who was reporting not only the hummingbirds that they saw out their yard, but also whether or not they provided a hummingbird feeder, we could see that over time in the Pacific Northwest, not only have Anna's hummingbirds expanded their winter range, but people have started to provide more and more hummingbird feeders over time. So then you have to ask, well, what? What came first, the hummingbird or the hummingbird <laughs> feeder? And I don't really know the answer to that, but it's amazing to me the the interplay between what we're doing in our backyards and what the birds are doing. There's definitely a connection between those two things. Mm. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I this is kind of an interesting year in many ways, globally for human the human race, et cetera, but also... Um, for those of us who are sort of in the north, it's, I think, going to be what's called an eruption year. And um, it's possible that some of us will be seeing some visitors from the north, the so-called winter finches that we don't normally see. Can we just quickly tell people what that is? And I'll give a link to where people can find the winter finch forecast as well. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Yes. um, These eruptive years are referring to um, a, a behavior where some species of birds will leave the, their northern boreal winter habitat and come south, and they tend to accumulate at, around bird feeders when they do this. And so what has happened is there's a lack of their natural foods, and so they move to other places to find food. We benefit from their, they're basically having a tough time, but then we get to see them all. And so things like red poles, pine siskins, evening grosbeaks. beaks, are showing up in people's yards in more southern locations this year, more than they have for a long time. And we're already getting reports of these birds, even though Feeder Watch hasn't even begun yet. So it's, yes. this is going to be a big year for these eruptive finches and grosbeaks. beaks. 
So be on the lookout and report it to Project Feeder Watch. And we're going to give with the transcript, of course, we're going to give all the links on how to join. We're going to have the giveaway of a couple of memberships on me. And um, I want to remind people about the, the webinar you're doing uh, with a colleague on the 19th of November at noontime Eastern. I'll give uh, that free webinar for people who want to know more and ask questions. Um, so, Emma, I'm excited. I, I think more than any other year, I'm excited. I think I need the companionship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we all do this year. So. Well, thank you yeah. for making time. I know you're busy and I, I appreciate you're making time um, to kick this off with us. So thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. All right. Talk to you soon again. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. And I hope I'll talk to all of you soon again, too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at AwayToGarden.com or on Facebook and Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening and bird feeding meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of AwayToGarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio. <laughs>